Holy Spirit, your anointing upon this. Father, we just realize how vital the, the understanding of this teaching is vital. And Lord, we know that there is resistance to it in the spirit, and that's okay. Father, we just say, Lord, we pray that you would have your way. We pray for the spirit and the power of Elijah to rest upon this teaching. We pray, Father, for the, the, the Holy Spirit to move, the Holy Spirit to work. And we say, Father, it's not by power, it's not by might, but it's by your spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And we commit this into your hands in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so go ahead and let's go ahead and turn in your Bibles. We're now on, we're, we're still teaching the class God's Eternal Purpose. And we're now on session seven, a family of sons. Session seven, a family of sons. And so... This session brings us into Ephesians chapter 1, which is one of the most incredible chapters in the entire Bible. And you've got to understand that when Paul's writing Ephesians chapter 1, when he's writing the whole book of Ephesians, he's in a Roman prison cell. He's, he, you know, he's in these terrible conditions in a Roman prison cell, so the natural tendency would be for him to be uh, gloomy and depressed and sad and mopey, but there's, it's anything but that when you read chapter 1. Chapter 1, Paul is on this, almost like he's on this caffeine high, so excited about God's eternal purpose. And so Paul comes to us with this passion. Paul comes to us with this enthusiasm. And he's trying to capture and express that which is beyond words. It's, it's beyond words in the eternal counsel of God. And he's trying to put human language to it. And Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 is, you know, if you read through it, he's breaking out into worship. He's breaking out into prayer. He's overwhelmed by the revelation of God's eternal purpose. He's overwhelmed by the revelation of that which took place before one act of creation. And so Paul's writing, and he gets to the high point, I believe, one of the high points of this chapter and he gets in Ephesians chapter 1, verse, eight, verse 17, verse 18 actually. What happens is, is Paul is, is in his message and he's realizing, okay, these things cannot be comprehended by articulation of human language. What I'm talking about is so far beyond the mind's ability to understand that Paul says, okay, hold on, I'm going to stop my teaching and my writing right now and I'm going to pray for you. And he prays for the Ephesians that they would have revelation. We, we've shared this over and over and over. But one of the things Paul prays in verse 18, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened so you would know what is the hope of his calling. we said this so many times, but that calling is not a vocation for you on the earth. It's not like, should I go and be a missionary? Should I be a school teacher? Should I be a software programmer? Should I be a preacher? Paul is on eternal ground when he makes that statement. See, Paul is saying he wanted the Ephesians to know what the hope of their eternal calling was because they can't comprehend it, we can't comprehend it apart from revelation. And so Paul's really saying here, I want the Ephesians to know what is, has been in the heart of God before eternity passed. But now he makes his next statement, which I love what he says, the next statement. He says, that they would know what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. This is not your inheritance in Jesus Christ. Though we have an inheritance in Jesus Christ, and though that is incredible, Paul's not talking here about your inheritance in Jesus Christ. He's talking about God's inheritance in you. See, it's a, it, God has an inheritance in you. There is something in the heart of God the Father and God the Son that he wanted a people for himself. And Paul is, is breaking out into prayer and he says, I want them to have a revelation of God's inheritance in them. Not just their inheritance in God, but God's inheritance in them. And so if you look in your notes on page one, we, we've shown this chart over and over and over and over.
But so far, we've looked at how, the, in the last few sessions, how the son's life leads to fullness of life. And that's point, that's point D and E in that chart. The son's life, the son's implanted life in us, leads to fullness of life. But now, in the next three or four sessions, I think it's going to be this session and the next three sessions, we're going to be really focused on F, God's inheritance in his people. Now, we will also talk about what our inheritance in Christ is, but we're going to really focus on that. And so, as we're going to see over the next few sessions, is that God the Father has an inheritance in, in a family of sons. God the Son has an inheritance in a worthy bride, and God the Holy Spirit has an inheritance in a temple. So God has an inheritance. There is an inheritance that was predetermined before one act of creation in the eternal counsel of the Godhead. There was before one act of creation was established that God himself, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit would have an inheritance in the people of God. And that's what Paul is dealing with. That's what we are dealing with here in Ephesians 1. Now, just imagine this for a second. Just imagine there's a father and there's a mother and they have one child. And they've loved this child. And they've loved this child with passion since the child could, I mean, was born. Since the day he started crawling until his last high school basketball game, this, this father and this mother loved this one son with all of their heart. They laughed together. They cried together. They grieved together. They went on vacations together. They weren't just father and son and son and mother. They were actually best of friends. And so the father and the mother, they wanted so desperately, they wanted so badly to have more children, but they were unable to. And they, because it was the, the driving force of their son, whom they loved so much, they wanted to have multiple children like him. And that kind of brings us into the burden of the father's heart. Is that before one act of creation, God the Father had a burning passion for his son. God, and we talked about this back in session one. But God the Father's heart was burning in love with his son. The affection for God the Father for the beloved son, Jesus Christ, burned with fire before one act of creation. He was the beloved son and always has been the beloved son. But that passion, that desire that God the Father had for his son... Uh, developed into the father this desire to have a family of sons just like his son. And we begin to see the revelation of this in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, when the writer of Hebrews says, God is bringing many sons to glory. That is God's heart. God the Father's heart is that he would have a family of Christ-like sons who were just like Jesus Christ to him. That has been, that is part of God's eternal counsel. That is part of God's eternal purpose. Is God the Father wants a family of sons just like his son? And that brings us here to Ephesians chapter 1. That brings us here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, where Paul is unfolding the blueprint from heaven. Paul is unfolding the blueprint before one act of creation. And in verse 5, he makes a staggering statement. And he says, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. Now, I just need to make one statement for us. Is that this word predestined has been hijacked by extreme teachings in Calvinism that say... You know, God predestined who would go to heaven, and God predestined who would go to hell, and God predestined every event that would take place. And if that happened, it was predestined by God. And they've carried this into this teaching here in Ephesians 1, 5, and, and they say, they look at it and say, this was predestined from that perspective. That's not what Paul's saying. That word predestined means determined beforehand. Here's the point we need to understand. It was God's purpose that was determined beforehand. It was God's plan that was determined beforehand. It was not our choice that was determined beforehand. 
It was not our response that was determined beforehand. It was the plan of God to adopt the children of or, or the, his creation into his family as his very own sons and daughters. It was that plan that was predetermined, not our choice, not our response. And so here we have, in Ephesians 1.5, we have the heart of God. See, the eternal purpose is rooted in the heart of God. It's not just the God, the creator, who's bored and says, okay, I need to do something because I'm bored. It's the Father's heart moving him to create and to establish his eternal purpose. So in Ephesians 1.5, Paul says, we have been predestined to adoption. But what I found as I've just studied this and as I just listen to people, you know, in the body of Christ, what I found is that most Christians make this one mistake. They look at adoption through the lens of the 21st century. They look at adoption through American eyes, through the Western world, and they say, oh, adoption means that we were orphans and God brought us into his family. And that's partly true. That's partly true. But they apply the paradigm of the, of the 21st century into what Paul was writing about in the first century. And so if we really, really want to have an understanding of what Paul means by adoption, we've got to have a Greco-Roman mindset. In other words, we've got to understand the Roman mindset that was in place when Paul was writing the book of Ephesians because he has that, that custom in mind. And if we don't understand that custom, then we can't fully understand what it means to be adopted as God's sons. Now, I remember... The first time that I ever heard about this, now I was just like most Christians, I just assumed when it, it said God adopted us, all it meant was we were orphans and God brought us outside of his family and made us his very own children. That's what I thought for, for years without even thinking twice about it because I was looking through the lens of the, first, of the 21st century, not through the first century. And I remember we were in Busia, Kenya, doing a pastor's conference, and we were having dinner with one of our life school leaders, Paul Musungu. I absolutely love Paul. He is doing awesome work. He's an incredible man of God, training people out in the remote parts of western Kenya. And we were having dinner, and the, there's two things about that dinner I remember. It was our di dinner conversation. But one thing I remember about that dinner is Paul was eating a whole tilapia. And the thing that stood out to me when he was eating that whole tilapia was the eyes of the tilapia were bulging out at him. The eyes of the tilapia were staring wide open to Paul. And so Paul, and I'm just like thinking, how can he possibly eat this? How could he possibly eat a fish that's staring at him? So, you know, you're trying to carry on this conversation, but in the back of your head, you're kind of just going, how is he going to eat fish eyes? And so, you know, half of what he said, I probably didn't even hear because I'm going, how's he going to eat fish eyes? So anyway, he ate the fish eyes because Africans think if you eat the fish eyes, you get a lot smarter. Um, I don't want that kind of knowledge. I would rather be, not have that kind of knowledge than eat fish eyes. But I remember the other thing that Paul said when we were talking is he said, have you ever studied first century adoption? And I said, no, I don't even know what you're talking about. He said, and he started beginning to explain to me about, the, about adoption in the first century. And as he explained this to me, my eyes were open as wide as his fish. And I was like, oh, I've never seen that before. I have never, I mean, just like the light bulb went on. And I was like, that answers so many questions I've had for so many years is understanding that the custom of adoption in the first century was vastly different than the custom of adoption in the 21st century. And that understanding, when I got home, I began to research and I began to just to try to verify, like a Berean, is, this, is what he said accurate? Is what he said true? And I found out, yes, what he said was accurate, what he said was true. And I discovered this book called Paul in the Greco-Roman World. I mean, it's 700 pages. It's, it's not something you're just going to snuggle up with by the fire and read. I mean, it's not the most entertaining, entertaining reading, but this, he had a chapter in there about adoption in the first century, and that chapter changed my entire view on so many things, and it opened my eyes so wide. And so what I want to do just for a second is just kind of give you a brief overview of Greco-Roman adoption in the first century because we need to bring that custom 
into our interpretation of Scripture and not bring in our 21st century custom because it distorts really what God's saying. And so if we understand this, adoption in the first century was vastly different than adoption in the 21st century. See, in the, tw in the 21st century, adoption is we bring a child or a baby in from another family that, who is unable to raise that child or who's suffering abuse, and we bring them in at a very young age, and we make them our own child, and they become part of our very family. Now, adoption in the first century was not so much concerned about bringing a child into the family as it was about inheritance. You've got to get this. It's about inheritance. That, that was the primary concern for adoption, was revolved around inheritance. And so because, because the life expectancy back then was so short, fathers a lot of times lost their children or they didn't have an heir to pass on their inheritance. Maybe they had uh, girls, but they didn't have sons to care for their uh, mother and their daughter, his daughters or whatever. And so they would bring in some, a, a child or a mature, actually a mature son from the outside of the family into the family, make that son their very own child, and that son would be in line for the inheritance. And so if you look in your notes here, page 3, point F, James Walters wrote the chapter of uh, this book I'm referring to, and he, here's what he says. It's a very scholarly book. He, he really knows what he's talking about. And he says, because the, fundam the fundamental motive for adoption was the continuation of the family, a Greco-Roman father thought first about his estate and what to do about his inheritance and only secondarily about adoption. So that's what we need to understand. Adoption in the first century was related to inheritance, not bringing a young child into the family who didn't have parents to raise them. It was for the continuation of the inheritance so that the inheritance could be properly managed without being squandered and wasted. And, and so that's the mindset that we have to get into to understand this. And so due to the uh, short life expectancies and high infant death rates, many families in the Greco-Roman world teetered on the brink of extinction. And so that's why adoption was so popular. And so, you know, here, if you look at, um, well, let's look at Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Whether, whether a child or a son, really a mature son, whether a mature son was brought from the outside of the family and adopted into the family, or whether the father designated their young child as the heir, what would happen is whether the adopted son or the young child, they would be placed under a guardian and a tutor, and that guardian and tutor would specifically prepare them for the time when the adoption was complete, the son placement was complete, and the son who was now prepared, the son who was now ready, was placed into the inheritance as legal heir. That's what Paul's talking about here in Galatians chapter 2 or 4. He says, Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. See, Paul's alluring, or alluding to, Paul's alluding to a metaphor, the, a Greco-Roman metaphor of adoption. He's alluding to that, and he's saying, our adoption into God's family is like that. We are placed under a tutor. We are placed under a a child trainer that would prepare us for the adoption. Now, here's the main thing we need to understand. Whether it was a child brought in from the outside, whether it was a young child set apart, designated as heir to be groomed, here's the main thing we need to understand, is adoption was the placing of a mature, of a mature responsible, well-groomed son as the legal heir of the family inheritance. In fact, if you read Ephesians 1.5 and you look at the Greek word adoption, it's actually made up of, two, of one word. We know you read it and it says adoption of sons. It's actually one word in the Greek, and that word is weothesia. And that word means son placement. We're going to look at that in a minute, but that word means son placement. And so 
What Paul's saying here in Ephesians 1 5 is he's saying we have been predetermined in the heart of God and, and the, by the eternal counsel of God to be set into place as a son. That's what Paul's saying here. And so if you look on page three here, just to kind of recap and summarize, there are really three phases of a Greco Roman adoption in the first century. Three phases. Number one was the placement into the family. So the placement into the family, if the father did not have an heir to continue on his inheritance, they would bring a child into the family and adopt that family, and usually it was a mature child, they would adopt that family as their very own son. The second phase is the preparation for the inheritance. The preparation for the inheritance. Number two is the designated heir, whether brought in from the outside or whether a natural born child, that, that child would be designated the heir, and that heir would then be placed under the tutelage and the instruction of a child trainer. And that child trainer would be specifically responsible to bring that child into maturity, to make sure the child had the responsibility and the character to handle the inheritance so that the child would not squander the inheritance. And so that consisted of this whole process of discipline, of grooming, of character development, of correction, of discipline, of you know, pointing out faults and things that they've messed up. And you know, so it was a grueling process of preparation this child had to go through. Then number three is the placement into the inheritance. When the child was now a son, when the adopted son was now ready and groomed and everything was ready and the father said, now the child is ready for the inheritance. At that right time, they were ready to be placed as a legal heir into the inheritance. And so then the father placed his son, son placement, that's the word we translate adoption, placed the son over the inheritance as the legal heir. And so that when the father was passed away, that son could rightfully go into his position of overseeing the family inheritance. Does that make sense? That's the custom that Paul is bringing into the picture in, in uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. Now, we're on page 4 here in our notes. To really understand adoption and to really understand that word we ought to see a, We've got to look at it, what it means in the Greek, and we've got to understand the distinction between technon and weos. You know, sometimes when you're reading the Bible, understanding the Greek words aren't, aren't real important. This is one of those things when it's really, really important to understand the distinction between technon and weos because it greatly defines how we interpret a particular scripture. So... In Ephesians 1.5, Paul is talking and he says, well, we have received our adoption as sons. And I said this again, but I'll say it again. Is that Paul used the Greek word weothesia. And he used it to describe, and like we said, that word means son placement. That word is made up of two compound words, weos, which means a son, and tithima, which means to set, put, or place. And so what Paul's saying here is he's saying that adoption in the first century was son placement. It involved not only the bringing in of a child into the family, but it also involved the placing of the son into the inheritance as legal heir. Now here, page four, um, according to the Theological Dictionary of, New of the New Testament, we ought to see a might refer either to the act or to the result of adoption. Now, when we say the act of adoption, we mean the act of bringing in a son from outside the family into the family. That would be the act of adoption. Now, the result of adoption would be when that child was now well-groomed, whether it was a natural heir or one from the outside, when that child was groomed, when that child was ready, when that child was then prepared, that child would then be placed into the inheritance, and that was the result of adoption. That was the end result. That was the finalization of adoption. That really is what adoption was all about, was about inheritance. And so understanding this helps us understand exactly what Paul is getting at. <clears throat> Now, let's talk about 
technon and weos, because again, adoption is sun placement. So we got to understand weos. We need to understand technon. So here in your notes on page four, point number D is, let's look at technon first. Paul said in Romans 8.16, that the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. That word children is in the Greek is technon. And that means offspring or child. And so the easiest way to think of technon is a child by birth. A child who has the nature of their father. A child who is born and inherits the, the DNA of their, their father. And so Paul's saying is that when you're born of the Spirit, you have God's Spirit in you. When you're born of the Spirit, you have God's very DNA in you. That makes you a technon. That makes you a child. Now in Romans 8, 14, Paul uses a different word. He uses the word weos. And we've looked at this, but we're going to look at it again. Paul says, all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. And so what we see, we begin to see, is we begin to see a distinguishing between those who are born of God and those who have the character of God worked out in their, into their soul. So we have the technon of God who are born of God, but now we have the weos of God who are moving into maturity. And so Paul's saying, all who are led by the Spirit of God, if you've been in the church long enough, you know there are many, many truly born again children of God that are not submitting to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. If you don't know that, come talk to me. As a pastor, you know that. <laughs> so Paul is saying here the distinguishing mark between a one who's born of God and one who is a mature son of God is they take up the cross. They put to death the deeds of their flesh. That's what the context is about. Those who have embraced the cross life, those who said, my self life is going to be crucified. Those who have embraced the work of, of the cross, the way of the cross, the cross life into their soul, Paul says, these are sons of God. Being led by the Spirit doesn't just mean we get a dream or a vision or we get a word and we go here and we go there, we go to Africa, we go to Germany, whatever. Being led by the Spirit means putting to death the deeds of the flesh. That's what Paul's getting at. And so, if understanding that, and I got some, some, some other quotations by Vine's Dictionary that also goes further into that, but there's other examples. I mean, even in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, when you experience persecution, pray for your enemies so that you may become weos of your Father who is in heaven. It was already assumed that God was their Father, but by taking on the nature of Christ and by praying for those who persecute you, Jesus saying that you may become weos, that you may become like the Son of God in character and demonstration. And there's a lot of other references throughout the scriptures. I mean, you could look at the parable of the wheat and the tares when the, the Lord is saying that the harvest is coming to maturity. And that's when he says the sons of the kingdom are like the wheat. And he uses the word weos to say that we will see the greatest, uh, the greatest harvest of mature sons of God at the end of the age. You could look at uh, Hebrews 12. You could look at Revelation 21.7. There's a lot of different cases in the scriptures where the writer uses weos to stress maturity and Christ-likeness and character, and that's always tied into being placed into the inheritance of the Father. Make sense? So look on page five, point, point J. In a practical way, I'm just going to read this just so I say it right. In, in a practical way, here's how a New Testament writer would use technon or weos. If a writer wanted to refer to a child as a son or a daughter, they could use either technon or weos. However, when a writer wanted to emphasize the honor, the respect, the worthiness, the rank, the position, the Christ-likeness or the moral qualities that distinguished a mature believer from a nominal believer, they would always use weos rather than technon. 
As is always the case, context determines how a verse should be interpreted. A, a great example of this is Jesus. Uh, I think over 200 times the New Testament uses weos to refer to him as the Son of God. Only once did they use the word technon, and that was in when he was 12. And so the writers of Scripture always referred to him as the mature Son of God, as the firstborn Son, as the one in line for the inheritance. And so you can just keep, you know, have that in mind as you, as you study this out. But just to summarize, Technon describes how we become God's children at new birth and how we receive the indwelling spirit and become new creations. We also, on the other hand, describes how as Technon of God, we mature into we us. All right? So that means we have his character, we have his nature, we have his likeness. We become conformed into the exact representation of Jesus Christ. And so th there's a lot in there in the notes that I'm not going to cover, but just for the sake of time, that's the distinction between technon and weos. And that, that's very, very helpful to understand as we get in to this teaching. So now page five, let's, let's, uh, let's go back to Ephesians chapter one. Having now, now that we have the background knowledge now that we understand Greco-Roman adoption of the first century, now that we understand the three phases of first century adoption, now that we understand weothesia and what weos means and what technon means, and that, that weos or weothesia refers both to the act of adoption and also the result of adoption, we can now go back and read Ephesians 1.5 and have a better understanding of what Paul is saying here. So let me read that again. Ephesians 1.5. Paul says that we've been predestined to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. See, Paul is reaching back in with all of this information, with all of this uh, background in mind, and here's what I believe Paul is saying. I believe Paul is saying in that one statement, so you've got to have all this background information to fully understand what that one statement means. Paul is saying in this one statement, he's saying this, there are three phases of our adoption as sons. There's three phases of our adoption as sons. Using the metaphor of Greco-Roman adoption, Paul is pointing out there are three phases of our adoption as sons. The first phase is found in Galatians chapter 3 and chapter 4. And that first phase is placement into God's family. And so what hap is happening in Galatians chapter 3 and chapter 4, Paul is showing us that our initial act of adoption. Now let me say this. Our initial act of adoption is individual. That's important to understand. And you're going to see why in a minute. That initial act of adoption is individual. In other words, we all come to the Lord at different times. We're all born again at different times. We all accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior at different times. And because of that, we are each individually adopted in the initial act of adoption at random in different times. That makes sense? And Galatians 3 and 4 is describing that initial act of adoption. Now let's look at Galatians chapter 4. And what we see here. And, if, and I got it in my notes, but what we see here that Paul is doing is Paul is taking Greco-Roman adoption and he's applying it to our adoption in the, new, in the new covenant. And he's saying, he's basically saying Abraham is the father, the inheritance, and you can read it in the notes, the inheritance is the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit. The law is our child trainer who prepared us as a tutor to lead us to Christ. And we needed to be adopted. We needed to be placed into the family of God so that we could become a legal heir in order to receive the indwelling Holy Spirit, in order to receive the inher inheritance of Abraham. That's kind of the background here. And so Paul is saying now in Galatians chapter 4, he's saying in verse 4, he says, When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. 
That is the individual adoption. That is the initial act of adoption. And that is when God the Father brought us in from another family, outside the family, into his very family. We were orphans, and now we're brought into God's family. And he made us in a legal position, his son. And therefore, because we are sons, this is what Paul's saying, verse 6, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. What he's saying is this. Because you've been placed as a son into Abraham's inheritance through Jesus Christ, you now inherit what was promised to him, which is the Holy Spirit. Make sense? That son placement, that initial son placement, made God our father by both adoption and new birth. We are God's children. We are God's son by adoption. We are God's technon by new birth. Is that clear? That's phase one. And you, you can read more about it in the notes. And we'll, we'll go through that in, in, a, in a bit. But phase two is the preparation for Christ's inheritance. See, once we are born of God, once we have the indwelling spirit, once we have the DNA of Christ, once we have God's DNA inside of us, we are now not only his adopted sons, we are his born-again children, his born-again technon. And then what God does immediately is he places us under the child trainer, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, I, I like what T. Austin Sparks, who wrote, uh, back, you know, 50, 60 years ago, back in 1940s, however long that is, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, T. Austin Sparks says that, is that we are now placed into the school of sonship unto adoption. The school of sonship unto adoption. It's a beautiful way to say it. That's the way the Holy Spirit works in us. He is now our child trainer. He is now the one who is bringing us unto adoption as sons so that the full adoption is, is worked out to the final result. We're placed in the school of adoption. We're, we're placed in the school of sonship where the Holy Spirit is giving his rod to us and he's bringing correction, he's bringing discipline, he's bringing uh, chastisement. He's bringing correction, circumcision, crucifixion to us. I mean, how many of you know the Holy Spirit does that? Thank God he does that. And God isn't doing it because he's mean and he's grumpy and he's in a bad mood and he gets angry about you. He's doing it with a purpose. See, God's discipline, God's child training is for a purpose. It's for his eternal purpose. God is not disciplining you because he's mean. God is not disciplining you because he's angry. He's disciplining you so that you don't squander and miss out on the inheritance that he has for you. And I'm talking about into the eternal ages. And so he places us into the school of sonship unto adoption. He places us under the governmental hand of the Holy Spirit. And when you're under the governmental hand of the Holy Spirit, you can get away with nothing. Every thought the Holy Spirit corrects. Praise God for that. Every wrong motive the Holy Spirit says, your motive was this. It was selfish. Everything we do under the inspection of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is taking us from technon to weos. The Holy Spirit is bringing us who are heirs of Christ by position into heirs of Christ in experience. He's bringing our legal position, or, or actually our living condition, in line with our legal position. That's the second phase. The third phase is the actual placement into Christ's inheritance. Now, whereas the initial act was individual, this son placement is corporate. This son placement has not yet happened. This son placement is what, what Paul talked about in Romans 8.23 he says, we groan for our adoption as sons. We don't yet have the full adoption as sons. That's the result of adoption. That's the placing into Christ's inheritance. That's not done individually. That's done corporately. That's done by what Paul said in Ephesians 4.13, 4, a mature man, the full measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. 
This thing we're talking about, this thing God's doing is not in just individual. It applies individually. We are all under the child training hand of the Holy Spirit, but it's going to be the actual son placement, like Romans 8.23 says, is going to be when Jesus comes back. Paul said the redemption of our bodies is when we will be adopted. It's a mouthful. That's corporate. That's the result of adoption. That's the son placement into the inheritance of Jesus Christ. That is when we, you know, we are, Paul said, if we suffer with him, then we will also reign with him. He said, we are his co-heirs if we suffer with him. If we remain under the governmental hand of the Holy Spirit, if we remain under the hand of the, of the Spirit, who is a child trainer, if we remain under his hand, Paul's saying, then you will be co-heirs. We don't flee the discipline of the Lord. And this is corporate. This is what T. Austin Sparks said. He said, the graduation from the school of sonship is to the throne. When you graduate from the school of sonship, it's to the throne. Revelation 3, 20 or 21. It's to the throne. You will graduate to the throne of God. We're going to talk about this later. This is where this whole thing is leading. And the way I like to look at this, think of it like this. In our marriage to Christ, we are the moment we're born again, every one of us individually are betrothed to him at the point of salvation. He becomes our bridegroom through betrothal. We then go through a preparation process. The bridegroom has gone away, and he's preparing a place for us. He's going to come again to us. That's Matthew 25. Those who make themselves ready will then be the corporate bride who participate in the wedding supper of the Lamb. See, betrothal is individual. Marriage is corporate. Our initial adoption is individual. Our, adoption, our son placement, which is final, is corporate. See, God is going to have one mature son. He's going to have one son with many members. The head in full maturity, connected to the body in full maturity. That's where this thing is headed. That's why it's going to be a corporate adoption. Now, there, there's a lot to say about phase one, phase two, and phase three. And so I'm going to just spend the rest of this session talking about phase one and phase two. We'll talk about phase three in another session. Um, in the next session, we're going to talk about what exactly our inheritance in Christ is. Because we're being, we are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. We are in placement. We are in uh, our destiny is to be heirs with Jesus Christ. But a lot of us are like, okay, what does that even mean? And we're going to talk about that in session eight, the next session. But in this session, we're going to just drill into a little bit more detail of what it means to be placed into God's family. The first thing that we need to understand, and that's page seven, the first thing that it means to be placed into God's family is that God is our Father. This might sound basic, but so powerful that when we are both legally adopted as His Son and we are His born again technon, we are His born again child. So when God takes us, he takes us who are orphans. He takes us who are fatherless. He takes us who are rejected. He takes us who are just scattered and aimless with no purpose. And he loved us and he sought us out and he chose us and he brought us into his family and said, you are my beloved son. And because we're his beloved son, we then inherit the promise of Abraham and we receive the indwelling spirit, which makes us his technon his child by new birth. So we are God's children by both birth and adoption. John said that as many as received them, to him he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, John 1, 12, who were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Those who are born of God, those who are born of the Spirit, are God's technon. God's children. We have his very seed. We have his very DNA. We have inside of us the Spirit of God who says, Abba, Father. That term is a, is a, a term of intimacy. It's a term of friendship. It's a term of 
of just this uh, comfortable relationship we have with God the Father. This doesn't mean we're, we lack the fear of God. It does not mean that we can just randomly or haphazardly approach him, but it means that we have this intimate uh, fellowship with God our Father. He, Abba. It's the heart cry of the Spirit of God. Abba. It, we say, Abba, Father. He is our Father. Now, down to uh, point G, it's to summarize, God is our Father through adoption and new birth. See, adoption gave us the legal position. And I want you to understand this. This is important. Adoption gave us the legal position of a son, of a weos. While new birth made us God's child, his technon, in experience. Put another way, adoption imputed to us a position of sonship, while new birth imparted to us God's very own DNA. And so what God wants to do in this child training process is he wants to take our legal position as a we us and he wants our living condition to be aligned with our legal position so that in actuality and in experience, we become mature sons of God. We are conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. The second point is our Father loves us deeply. I mean, if we can understand the depth and the width of the Father's love for us, all we have to do is think back Think back to session one when we said before anything was created, before the throne, before the angels, before one act of creation, God the Father was in this relationship with his son, and there was, there was nothing created. There wasn't even a throne. It was just unapproachable light. And God the Father and God the Son were in this tight, intimate relationship. They were not bored. They were never bored. They were never lonely. The overflow of God's love for his son burned and flowed out of his heart. And, you know, I can just imagine the father saying over and over, you are my beloved son. And we see it even when Jesus was on earth. The father would break down into the earthly ministry of Jesus and just open heaven and say, that you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The point is God the father loves his son with a passion we can never understand, with a passion that's far beyond words, with a passion that we could never even be, begin to comprehend. It is infinite. It's explosive. I mean, it's just massive in implications. It will blow our minds away. But here's the thing. Jesus said, the Father loves you just like he loves me. That's staggering. That's staggering that God the Father loves you, loves me, just like he loves Jesus. Let that sink in for a minute. Your Father in heaven loves you, his adopted son, his technon by new birth, just like he loves Jesus. That's amazing. That blows our minds. God, the Father's love for us, how incredibly good, how incredibly loving is God our Father. You know, so many people grow up with, this, with, a, with a really not a good earthly father. I was going to crack a joke, but I decided not to. <laughs> Thankfully, I did not. I was going to crack a joke about my dad, but I'll refrain. Actually, I will say one thing. A long time ago, when he, when he first started the church, I remember, I, I, you know, my memory's kind of gone a little bit, but I remember he did an altar call for those who've had an abusive father relationship. And I can't remember if we went, Michael probably remembers better. Did we, did we go down? We were talking about going down. I can't remember. I don't, probably didn't go down, but we were all like, man, we should did not just say, we should go down and, you know, say that's me. And, you know, my dad's praying for that. But thankfully I didn't have that. But so many people have had, you know, these bad earthly father experiences and they've, they've kind of projected unto God, the father, what they grew up under their, their earthly father. 
And God is completely unlike our earthly fathers. Even the best of our earthly fathers, God is so transcendent above any of our earthly fathers. God the Father is incredibly good. God the Father is incredibly affectionate. God the Father is so jealous for you to fulfill your destiny. And when he disciplines you, he's not doing it because he's angry or he's mad or he's in a bad mood. He's doing it as a child trainer, gearing you and grooming you for the inheritance. See, God the Father loves you with a love that is beyond words. His perfect love casts out fear. And Paul hits on this in Romans chapter 8, and he says, you know, if you feel like you're alone, if you feel like there is no one there with you, he says, if God is for you, who is against you? You know, some might feel I'm being smothered and covered by spiritual warfare, and, and Paul says, he says that neither principality, nor angel, nor death, nor anything created can separate you from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ. You are more than a conqueror in Jesus Christ. That is the love of God for you. That is the love of the Father for you. His overflowing river of love breaks the power of fear, breaks the power of condemnation, breaks the power of rejection and shame and guilt and all of the other things that are negative. His love for you is beyond words. And if we could just feel what he feels about us, it would change us. It would transform us. God, your Father, loves you like he loves Jesus. This brings me to point three, is that God is a good father. He is a good, good father. He's incredibly good. Paul, again, I won't go into much detail just for the sake of time, but Paul gets onto this in Ephesians 1.5. He said, we've been adopted unto sons according to the kind intention of his will. That word, kind intention, is actually the word good pleasure. And what we see here is that God, his plan, his purpose for you is good and is motivated by his pleasure. It's motivated by his happiness. God is not some, you know, killjoy up in heaven who's in a bad mood. God is filled with joy. God is filled with happiness. And it's out of that happiness, out of that goodness, that God's plan for you comes. Yet his goodness is not in the fact that he just wants to bless you. His goodness is in the fact that he gives you himself. God is good not because he blesses us. God is good because he gives us himself. So many people in the church got this wrong, and they think God's good because he blesses me. God's good because he increases my finances. God's good because he increases favor and all these other things. God does that, but if that's all he did, he wouldn't be good. God's good because he, he brings us into a relationship with himself. He wants to bring us into the fellowship of the Trinity forever and ever and ever for the eternal ages to come. God the Father is jealous to bring you and me into that fellowship of the Trinity. That's why God's good. That's why God is working in your life. He is working jealously. He's working fervently. He's working passionately so that we can be brought into that fellowship of the Trinity. God is good. Number four is we have the DNA of the Son in our spirit. We have the DNA of the Son in our spirit. What makes us God's child is not some religious thing we did on an altar when we were in the fourth grade. What makes, us God's, what makes us God's children is we have the DNA of the Son of God in our spirit. We have the very seed of God inside of us. We have the DNA of God. We have the very genetics of Jesus Christ. If you were able to do a DNA test of your human spirit... Now, if anyone can figure this out, I don't think you can. But if you were able to, we would have the very DNA of Jesus Christ. His seed is in us. His nature is in us in seed form. His nature has been implanted to us. His nature has been engrafted to us. And that is what makes us his child. We are God's child, not only by adoption, but also by new birth. We, are, we have that very DNA 
inside of us. Now just imagine if Steve Jobs, if we were to take, be able to take the DNA of Steve Jobs, I don't know if a lot of people would want that DNA, but if you did, if they put that inside of you in seed form, when that seed began to mature, when that seed began to grow, you would become this incredibly brilliant, innovative software guru person that would just run this multi-million dollar organization. See, we, it wouldn't be long until after a while we were making millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars because we have the DNA of Steve Jobs in us. See, as born-again Christians, we have something far greater, far superior than the DNA of Steve Jobs. We have the DNA of Jesus Christ in us. And as his child by birth, we cry, Abba, Father. And it's because of that, that DNA in us that we have the potential to be conformed into an exact representation of Jesus Christ. Let's look at page 10. We're going to quickly look at phase two, our preparation for Christ's inheritance. Our preparation for Christ's inheritance. So phase one, we saw we were placed into God's family. Phase two is now that we are placed into God's family, we are being groomed for the throne. We are in the school of sonship unto adoption. We are being trained under the hand of the child trainer of the Holy Spirit. That's point number one. The moment we're born again, the Holy Spirit becomes our child trainer. And I just imagine that Paul would see, you know, a child being groomed for the inheritance back in the first century, and he would see the suffering this child would go through. He would see the correction this child would endure. He would see the discipline. He would see this child, all their friends going off and playing and doing all these different things. But this young child was under the tutelage of the child trainer. That's what it's like when we're placed under the hand of the Holy Spirit, under the governmental hand of the Holy Spirit, into the school of sonship, unto adoption. The Holy Spirit does not let us get away with anything if you submit to it. Now, we have the choice. We don't have to submit to it. If you submit to it, the writer of Hebrews said, if you endure child, if you endure discipline or chastening, and that word actually means child training, if you endure child training, you don't have to submit to it, but if you stay under the hand of the Holy Spirit in child training, then God deals with you as with we us, as with a son. Because it's only then in the child training of the Holy Spirit that he can prepare us to be a co-heir with Jesus Christ. So much of the church today does not want to be under the child training hand of the Holy Spirit. We want to do our own thing. We want to do it our own way. We want to just live our lives and do it this way and that way and just have a ticket to heaven. God will give us that choice. But for those who say we can't have just that, to those who say there is an eternal destiny for me, that goes beyond my short time on this earth. There is an eternal inheritance for me that I want to have throughout the ages of the ages of the ages of the ages. Then I come under the child trainer hand of the Holy Spirit, his governmental hand, his corrective rod, his chastisement, his discipline, bringing us into his alignment. Jesus talked about, really, that you can see a clear picture of this in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. That really is the child training of the Holy Spirit. God is, Jesus is confronting his church, his eyes with flames of fire, and he's calling out his church in their lukewarmness, losing their first love, uh, falling away into false doctrine and all these different things. And Jesus is coming to them like a child trainer, bringing, in fact, he says it in the message to Laodicea, those whom I love, I child train. Revelation 2 and 3 is a child training hand of the Holy Spirit to bring us under the Lordship of Jesus Christ and to get rid of inside of us all of the stubbornness, all of the selfishness, all of the rebellion, all of the independence, everything foolish, everything of the flesh, everything we inherited from Adam. That is driven out under the child training hand of the Holy Spirit, but is done with the purpose unto inheritance. 
He has a goal in it. He's not just in a bad mood. He has a specific eternal goal he has in mind, and that is to bring us as co-heirs with Jesus Christ. I mean, you think sometimes people go, well, you know, we've already received that inheritance. It's like this. My daughter, who's eight, is in line to drive when she's 16. She's destined to drive when she's 16. That's scary. That's scary, scary. Okay, if I was to give her the car keys right now, this is a matter of minutes before she ran into the side of the road and wrecked the car. She's not ready for the inheritance that she's destined for. It's like us. God's not going to give us the keys to the car when we're still childish and immature. And if we don't mature into the fullness of Christ, if we don't mature into his exact representation, then we can forfeit. We will not be ready for that inheritance. That's why it's important to stay under the hand of the Holy Spirit. That's what the word uh, child, or that's what the writer of Hebrews said. If you, uh, if you endure child training, if you stay under child training, if you don't run from it and resist it and refuse it, if you stay under that child training and say, God, you be God, be Lord in my heart, then God is dealing with you as he is with the mature son ready for the inheritance. Number two. The Father's goal is to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. This is the passion of the Father. This is the blueprint of the Father. God the Father will not settle for anything less except for full conformity into the image of His Son. That is what He is after. That is what He's jealous after. He wants us, his technon, to be conformed into the image of his son. This is what burned in his heart before one act of creation. This is what burned inside of him in the blueprint of eternity past. God the Father wanted a, a family of sons conformed into the exact image of Jesus Christ. I don't know how many of you remember jams. You don't have to raise your hand, but if you're 30 and over, you might remember jams. They were the surfing shorts that came up to your calf, and they were all, like, colorful and had flowers on them, and it was, like, the big hot thing in the 80s. But I remember being in the eighth grade in a home economics class, bored out of my mind, but I remember getting so incredibly excited because I got to sew my own pair of jams. And so what would happen is they would take the, we would take the pattern of the jams and we would take that pattern and then we would take the fabric and cut the fabric by the precise pattern laid out in the jams and we would cut that and the, the point is we had to make sure we cut it exactly and precisely like the pattern. If we didn't do that, the jams would look even more awkward than they already did. The point is God the Father has the pattern he is following and it's his son. The son of God is the pattern that he is conforming us into the, the chiseling, the, 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 uh, the chiseling, the crucifixion, the circumcision God's doing. He's following a predefined pattern that we might be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. That is his passion. That is his heart. Number three, the cross is how we become sons. We've already talked about this in a prior session. We won't, I'm all, all I'm going to say is just make one point and we'll move to the next one. Romans chapter 8, 13 and 14 shows us very clearly it is those who are led by the Spirit, those who put to death their flesh, those who put to death their flesh, these are the mature sons of God. The cross life is how we move from technon to weos. The cross life is how we move from our legal position of being a weos into our living condition of being a weos who is in the conformity to Jesus Christ. And number four, I know we're getting late, so bear with me on this one. This one, again, is a very important point, but turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 16. Number four, suffering trains us for reigning. Suffering 
trains us for reigning. Paul said that the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. We are technon of God is what the Greek word we means. And if technon, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, here's the key right here. And this is what most of the church does never even reads when they read Romans 8. They stop right here and they don't get into the suffering part because the, the church doesn't like the word suffering. I mean, how many times have you heard it? We're co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Yes, you're right, but there's a condition to it. It's suffering. Paul says very clearly, this is not just going to happen automatically. There's a condition to it. If indeed we suffer with him. And I think, again, I think, I think Paul's looking back at the young uh, the young child, the heir, under the brutal, now probably brutal is a wrong word, under the hand of the child training tutor uh, of, that was grooming him, the, the strictness, the discipline, the correction, the chastisement that was taking place. And he saw that suffering of that child and he said, you know what? That's kind of like what our child training is. Others may, others may go here, others may go there, others may run everywhere. But you can't get away with anything. And that suffering, even like Jesus, the, the Son of God himself, he was under the child trainer of the Holy Spirit. He learned obedience by the things he suffered. It says that in Hebrews. The Son of God was being groomed as a man for his inheritance. That's what Hebrews, a lot of it is about. And I think Paul is saying that the same way the Son of God learned obedience through suffering, we as his technon, under the governmental hand of the Holy Spirit, are, are suffering, we're experiencing correction. I mean, it's not fun when God takes you to the cross. If you think it's fun, you've never been. I assure you, it's terrible. I assure you, when God begins to deal with your self-life, it's not fun. And that suffering, if we don't run from that suffering, Paul's saying, if you suffer with him, you will also be a co-heir with Jesus Christ. Don't run from that suffering. Don't run from that child training. Don't run from it because that child training is grooming you to be the co-heir of Jesus Christ. And so as we bring this to a close, as we wrap this up, we see God's heart, God's incredible father's heart back in his eternal purpose back in his blueprint before one act of creation god the father saw his son and said i can't be i can't just have one son i've got to have millions and millions of sons just like him that blueprint from eternity past drove god the father to bring a, a multitude of creation and to adopt them into their family through the different phases. Phase one, bringing them into his family and making them technon, putting them under the child training hand of the Holy Spirit. And then finally and corporately at the end of the age, placing the corporate man, placing the corporate son into the inheritance of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ and the head of the head, Jesus Christ, connected as one, and together they rule and reign over the nations of the earth and over all of God's creation forever and ever and ever. See, there is a groan right now in creation. Creation is longing. Creation is groaning. Creation is yearning for the, re for the revelation and the coming of the manifest sons of God, of the revealing of the sons of God, of God's technon coming into we us, corporately, not just individually. There has been corporately, there has been many, or individually, there has been, you know, several throughout history, a remnant throughout history who've overcome and become his we us. But here at the end of the age, God is interested not just in a few individuals coming into this, but a corporate man, the full measure of the stature of Jesus Christ. God the Father is looking unto that day. All creation is longing for that day, yearning for that day. And I'm telling you, that day is coming soon. God is preparing us for the throne into the school of sonship 
And graduation to the school of sonship is graduation to the throne of God forever and ever and ever. Amen. Father, we come and we ask you, Lord, to open the eyes of our heart to this incredible revelation. Lord, I pray that, Lord, we would not resist the child training of the Holy Spirit. God, let us not resist the child training of the Spirit of God, we pray. Let us endure the discipline of the Lord that we would become conformed into the exact image of Jesus Christ. Lord, we just surrender to the Lordship of Jesus. And we say, God, have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.